and a 10 Fazbear Frights owners. Now this is a bit of a cheaty one, but the guys who actually end up opening are maybe where they're just like working in Fazbear Frights. The location that we're in for FNAF 3 don't actually have names even like let alone faces. The guy who says that they found old training tapes or the one who introduces the actual phone guy tapes has never really been seen. Which makes sense given that he's not really a major character, but it's still something that I think is worth mentioning, okay? Because without them, there would be no FNAF 3, which means that there'd be no rest of the series. Like either because they wouldn't have opened the place if they didn't exist, or even if they weren't like the owners and they were just like the key holders or something, they wouldn't have been there to open the door. Thus, no gameplay other than just standing outside. So even if you're mad at me for it, these guys, whatever their names are, deserve their moment in the spotlight. So. Thank you, possibly deceased FNAF 3 guys, for your service to this series as a whole, as well as your contributions to breaking my brain. I really appreciate it. And at 9, Lewis. Lewis was introduced in FNAF AR through emails that he's lucky only he is able to see and not HR. Lewis is a creepy co-worker of Ness who works IT at the company creating all the robots for the Fazbear Entertainment Delivery Service that we experience in Special Delivery. And is probably the creepiest damn character in the entire series. Including William. You know what? Honestly, I'm surprised that he wasn't killed. Especially because Ness is indeed Vanessa and Vanny. Since he seems to be onto their scheme a little bit, like he's intercepted search core and emails that just make Ness seem off and straight up like a serial killer since she ordered realistic human masks at some point, didn't she? Well, honestly, we know more about these human masks than we do about Lewis, since we know nothing about him. We only know his name, not even a voice or a face. So yeah, Lewis is certainly one of FNAF's hidden characters. And for the few people in the comments saying that FNAF AR is a fan game, no it's not. Why on earth would you think that it was, okay? What gave you that impression? It is a canonical entry to the series. It's not a full game, but it's still like FNAF 8.5 at, at least. And it ain't Jeremy. As I've said in the Souls Trapped in Animatronics video, Jeremy is probably the biggest troll name in FNAF history, being used for three separate characters. However, only two of them are actually direct victims of William. Jeremy is the name of one of the original missing children who goes on to possess Bonnie. The other Jeremy is a playtester for the Freddy Fazbear Virtual Experience, the one who was testing the game before Tape Girl, who ends up finding the glitch trap anomaly and that causes him to go mad. And by going mad, I mean genuinely psycho, It's since Jeremy ends up cutting off his own face, which is interesting, given that the Withered Bonnie animatronic as seen in FNAF 2 is also missing his face. It's interesting because like Withered Bonnie is the animatronic possessed by the missing children's incident Jeremy, but then this Jeremy cuts off his face. I mean like I don't know if that was, if, they, if it means anything or if it's intended or just a coincidence, but knowing this series I'm always worried that like the smallest detail is going to have the biggest consequence. Either way, hey, we don't end up seeing Jeremy's face before or after he removed it. And the fact that he removed it makes him even more hidden in my mind. But like bro, seriously, how how the hell did you do that? And it's seven original victims. While yes, we see the original victims' ghosts in the FNAF 3 Happiest Day minigame as well as when they create Springtrap, they literally all use the same ghost sprite, okay? So we haven't really seen their true forms in the games. We've seen a potential look for Cassidy in the survival logbook, but within the context of the games, we've never really seen what the original missing children look like. So in a way, Gabriel, Susie, Fritz, Jeremy, and Cassidy are all hidden characters in that sense. I know that you were probably expecting this list to be about characters that we don't know about, but how the hell could we make that list. That just doesn't seem possible. If we don't know the characters, how are we supposed to find out about the characters for a list? I have no contact with Scott Cawthon, and even if I did, I don't think that he'd spill the beans on characters we missed. I don't think it would happen. And it's six sister location technicians. The technicians are two employees of Fazbear Entertainment Inc. who used to work with the Funtime animatronics of Circus Babies Entertainment and Rental from FNAF Sister Location. One technician is soft spoken and seems bored with his job, implying that he may be used to it, while the other, who speaks using a Brooklyn accent, appears to be less experienced and more uneasy with the environment of Circus Babies. The two technicians appear for the first time during Night 4, when they use the scooper on Ballora, and during Night 5, their dead bodies are seen hanging in Ballora's gallery and the Funtime Auditorium. It's unknown why. Why Enner didn't use one of their bodies to escape? Some fans speculate that it was because the Funtime animatronics wanted to make Michael Afton suffer, because, like, you know, they thought he was William, they wanted to get revenge, they wanted to torture him. However, we never actually get to see the faces of these characters, and on all honesty, in my opinion, they could still be fake. Considering how these animatronics are at times able to recreate the voices of other people, could these actually just be dummy bodies meant to scare us? And, like, Ennard needed Ballora to get scooped anyway so that she could then 
become a part of Ennard. So why why would they want to kill them for revenge on that? Is it just is it because of the shocking baby thing? Because like even then, I feel like baby's probably into that. Halfway through into number five, Mrs. Afton. Despite the thorough belief in some fans that Mrs. Afton possessed Ballora, we haven't actually seen Mrs. Afton at all in the games. Well honestly, we don't even know her actual 100% confirmed as canon name. So a hidden character Mrs. Afton certainly is. We don't even know what happened to her or if she really existed at all, or if Afton's kids just were, were adopted and then he used Ballora as a surrogate mother. Like sure, there's a family table in Security Breach with a mother at it, but that could just be because there was a mother figure in their lives at least, but we don't know if that figure was the kid's biological mother or hell if she was even human, so yeah. There also isn't really any evidence in the game or any other real part of the lore that suggests what happened to her if she was married to William. Some say that she dies in a car crash. Um, I'd say that there's nothing that suggests she died at all, but uh, it, it's FNAF, so that, that is a safe bet. But other than that, there's not really an explanation as to what happened with Mrs. Afton, or who she was as a person, or even as a mother, okay, if she ever got the chance to be, so, yeah. Mystery! <laughs> In it for Tape Girl. Tape Girl was a developer for the Freddy Fazbear Virtual Experience in FNAF Help Wanted. However, given the unknown malicious code in the game, she left secrets scattered amongst the minigames in hopes that it would be dealt with at a later time. Pro procrastination right there. All of her tapes can be played in the tape room, which can be unlocked by hitting the tape placed on the shelf in the prize counter with any droppable item. Once unlocked, it can be accessed through the tape player placed above the smaller monitor in the, the level select room from Blacklight mode. The tape room is mostly just darkness with a desk in the center, but on that desk there is a shelf where all the tapes that you've collected are stored. The, the player can listen to them by just selecting them and then it goes in the tape player. You don't really need to pick anything up or move it. But all we ever see about Tape Girl is her voice. There is nothing else, which begs the question if she was even real or if this is a sort of like glitch trap acting like baby thing where he made her up so that we'd trust her and then he ultimately locked us away in our minds. Honestly, I, I don't doubt that. I feel like that could be a thing, although it's it's not likely. Getting close to the end in number three, the top. Now, whether or not she knew about this, okay, Vanessa's recommendation for the night guard position came from the top. That's how it's described in the game, which does end up confusing plenty of people in the administration as we learn from other various devil bags. She had no security experience and she was being transferred from another part of the company, but nevertheless, she still got the job despite multiple people saying that they wouldn't go forward with hiring her, which ultimately probably led to their deaths, if we're totally honest. So, who on earth is the one ordering her promotions? Seemingly, we got no f***ing idea. We could assume maybe it's William, but he's currently plugged in charging in the basement, so it would have to be someone else who knew her, or and knew Afton's interest in her, and then made her a VR tester so that she could then get possessed, and then made her a security guard afterwards so that Afton could get her to do what he needed her to do, but who could it possibly be? Matbat seems to think that it's Gregory as a hacker who's pulling the strings, but until that's confirmed, it's yet another person in this series that we've heard about, but I've yet to see. God damn it, Scott. But ultimately, in a number two, Henry Emily. While Henry does ultimately perish thanks to the FNAF 6 fire, he honestly should have been a target for William beforehand, especially once he learned about who was actually committing crimes in the restaurants, but William didn't go after him for some reason. I mean, like, it would have been, it, maybe it would have been too obvious, like, there were five murders that occurred inside the walls of the restaurants, and they already suspect William for it, but then boom, his business partner goes missing, and William is left as the sole proprietor to the business. That That is a super sus move that would definitely result in being ejected, okay? Like, motive means an opportunity. Motive, absolutely there, especially if, like, let's say William was, like, cheating with Henry's wife or something, which I doubt, but I mean, like, means, easy to find, just find the knife, and then, like, Honestly, killing Henry would only have resulted in William going to jail, which probably saved Henry's life, but still. Despite all of this, we still don't know what Henry looks like. I mean, we have the desk guy, who is like our best guess to be Henry, but that's 8-bit. And other than that, we have no look for him in the games. Maybe he shows up in like the Silver Eyes graphic novel, I'm not sure, but you're all adamant that the books and games are separate. Okay, so if he is, you can't yell at me in the comments without being hypocritical, okay? So if he's in the novels, if he's in the, the, the graphic novel where we actually get visual representation, you can't yell at me for it. I win. Ha! And finally, in number one, Phone Guy. 
Well, in the end, phone guy wasn't the killer. He still isn't really very helpful in the long run, considering how he says that we aren't actually going to get killed. Well, okay, like he warns us to be careful, but he doesn't say explicitly you're going to die. I don't know. I, I don't like this guy, okay? It he could have done so much more. And uh, in, in essence, all he said was be careful, it's trial and error. <laughs> because honestly, after surviving this job for so long, you'd think that whoever this phone guy is would have had some goddamn tips on how not to die. But instead, he just gives us the freaking company motto. Like, I don't care if one of the animatronics bit someone 10 years ago, okay? They're trying to kill me now, what do I do? Anyway, this is the original FNAF hidden character. Okay, we know that he's voiced by Scott, but unless the phone guy is moonlighting as a rogue indie game developer, they aren't the same dude, okay? We have no idea what the phone guy looks like, okay? He can't look like Scott unless he is the indie game developer now. So, yeah, we don't know what he looks like. And honestly, at this point, the phone guy might still be William Afton. And we just, we can't tell since we've never seen him. I mean, we've heard William talk, but maybe he was just faking an American accent like freaking Tom Holland does. Okay, it's a thing. In a 10 daycare hall. One of the most interesting aspects of a free roam game is all the secret areas and easter eggs you can hide. Like the Portal 2 easter egg hidden in Skyrim of all games. However in FNAF it's much more than that since each tiny easter egg or detail can help us figure out what the hell has been going on in this series for the past 8 years. Which makes the appearance of secret little cubby holes around the pizza plex very interesting. Like the one for the moon drop and sunny drop animatronic hidden behind the daycare center behind a Foxy poster unlocked by taking pictures of certain cardboard cutouts that are also actually on the poster. Which makes me think, are there more areas that need to be unlocked like that? Or something like that? I'm sure many have tried various things, but I don't know, it feels like there should be one for like the, the gun, the laser gun equivalent. In this little hole, however, you can find a mini game called Balloon Boy World, which we will talk about more later on. But also, it contains a duffel bag with lore and the golden moon animatronic plush required for one of the achievements. So it's certainly somewhere that you'd want to go. You can also get the achievement for playing the Bloom Boy World minigame also. And at 9, Vanessa Therapy. Something I was unaware of until completing the game and getting Roxy's eyes were 16 retro CDs that can be found towards the end of the game. You have to actually have Roxy's eyes to see them though, because they don't spawn in unless you have the eyes. These can be played with a CD player hidden in a sister location secret room. The retro CDs require Roxanne's eye upgrade on Glam Rock Freddy, and for the CDs to spawn in, Gregory has to be inside an upgraded Glam Rock Freddy be near the disc and like looking at where it would be and then exiting to actually be able to collect it otherwise it won't spawn in if you're looking away. The order in which the CDs are found does not seem to affect which recordings are unlocked just the amount of CDs found which is clearly a reference to the 16 tapes found in FNAF ER that were also weren't really found in a particular order. Collecting them just seemed to unlock them in sequence however these tapes seem to also contain therapy sessions between Vanessa and a therapist as well as a therapist and another individual who goes unnamed, but could also be Gregory. We don't know because they never talk. And it ate Fire Dave. One of the various lore duffel bags we can stumble upon in this game is a customer complaint titled Hi Dave, which upon inspection reads, quote, customer complaint, you should fire Dave, he sucks. And while it's short and sweet and to the point, it also is seemingly a reference to the FNAF novels, since if you're unaware, in the novels William Afton was introduced, but at first he was going by the alias Dave Miller. And considering how this customer says that we should fire Dave, I think that's a pretty telling way to reference the book's most infamous employee, and also reference the fact that Afton is in the pizza plex right below our noses. This duffel bag can be found on the farthest left bench next to the lockers in customer service, which seems to indicate that Dave also worked in customer service. Just a horrible place for a serial killer to work, just saying. And it's 7, Joy of Creation. The anticipation for the Fazbear Fanverse initiative is building now that Security Breach has released and we don't know anything about what's coming next in the main FNAF universe. However, there are actually references to some of the Fanverse games in Security Breach. For example, the Joy of Creation easter eggs of Ignited Freddy and Ignited Bonnie found on the House of Bear and House of Bear 2 arcade cabinets found around the Pizzaplex. This is something I actually picked up on my first time through, so needless to say, it's pretty damn cool that I was right about it. The House of Bear cabinet has Ignited Freddy 
Bonnie's silhouette standing in the doorway, and House of Bear 2's machine features Ignited Bonnie's face, which could be considered Withered Bonnie, but given the context of Ignited Freddy on the other one, I think it's safe to say that this is Ignited Bonnie. Plus, this can also explain how these games fit into the main timeline, since the fanverse games could just be the games that Scott's in-universe counterpart made. It would also explain why they have their own FNAF 1 version titled FNAF Plus. And at 6, Freddy Mercury. Did you know that Freddy Fazbear in the opening cutscene to FNAF Security Breach is actually making a reference to Freddy Mercury? Yeah, neither did I. But thanks to some helpful YouTube commenters, <laughs> Not on these videos, on, on other videos. It was pointed out to me there. While on stage when showcasing his name, Freddy Fazbear strikes a similar pose to Freddy Mercury, which is kind of iconic and understandable given that both their names are Freddy. And I don't really want to see Freddy getting up on his toes, grabbing his crotch and yelling, OW! in reference to Michael Jackson. Someone also ended up making an album cover for the glam rock band singing Bohemian Rhapsody, which is absolutely iconic and I love it. I kind of want to hear this now though. Like why can't we have this instead of like Freddy telling Gregory that he needs to vent like a sussy baka? Like why has that been going around? Like Gregory, have you heard of Among Us Gregory? You need to vent. I don't, I don't know. And why is my TikTok for you page filled with FNAF memes and FNAF related content all of a sudden? Okay? It was like the one safe place I had. But now, now there's like glam rock Freddy filters and like sunny drop filters and Gregory being a sussy baka and like uh but Vanessa I'm a material girl things like what the f man why Halfway through in number 5, Gregory's missing. This is something I picked up on in the second ending I got my playthrough, in what is commonly referred to as the worst ending, where you simply leave the pizza plex by yourself without Freddy. The first ending I got is actually the Vanny ending, which to me is my canon ending. It's, it's a different way to explain that. But in this ending, Gregory ends up running away and hiding in a cardboard box. This box is assumed by most to be his home, since he doesn't really have one and can't really return to the pizza plex. However, this is where this detail comes in. The newspaper he's using as a blank it has multiple silhouettes of the children who have gone missing this time around. Nine of them, this time to be exact. However, the one in the bottom left corner looks an awful lot like Gregory when he's standing in front of all those security monitors in the first Security Breach trailer. I'm just saying, especially when Vanessa says that he's been wiped from the system, and I'm pretty sure one of those lore bags also shows us that we've been wiped from the system as per someone's request. So that's certainly not a coincidence. And I doubt Scott used it and just thought, oh yeah, this is easy, let's do that. No, not a chance. There has to be something there. And at 4, Monty the Murderer. One of the biggest questions this game seems to have is where did Bonnie go? While with sister location, simply put, Funtime Chica was rented out, that's not really the case with Bonnie and Security Breach. We hear Freddy say that there isn't a bunny here anymore, in a somber way as if he was killed, but by who is the bigger question? In the lore duffel bags, we can find various bits of evidence though that suggest Monty could be to blame, since after all, he did end up replacing Bonnie as the new bass player uh, after his, um, accident. But was it really an accident? Let's look at what the bags say. Quote, the bowling alley needs a re-theme. While most of the Bonnie art was removed, kids keep asking where's Bonnie? Do we have an officially approved response? Which makes it seem like Bonnie isn't simply out of commission, but we can get even more specific. Quote again, 12.24am, Bonnie is seen leaving his green room in Rockstar Row headed east towards the atrium. 2.40am, Bonnie enters the East Arcade. 4.12am, Bonnie enters Monty Golf. And considering how that's where the log ends, we can be pretty certain that Bonnie ate the dust over at Monty Golf, which would make even more sense given that Monty replaced Bonnie, became more popular than Bonnie, and then was also the last place Bonnie was seen. Seems pretty sus to me. I mean, maybe Monty was the one who should have been venting. And in three, pizza rumors. Again, found in one of the lore duffel bags, we get quite an interesting parallel between Fazbear Entertainment and Chuck E. Cheese. Found in a party room outside the Moondrop Daycare, we can find, quote, recycled pizza? Customer complaint. The pizza we ordered was weird. Some pieces were different sizes or didn't fit together. One slice even had different toppings. Did you recycle the old pizza from the trash? I am never coming back here unless I am given some form of major discount. Angry mom. End quote. And while they're also playing on 
the Karen tropes, seemingly. This also has a larger reference to the conspiracy theory that Chuck E. Cheese was recycling their pizzas. It was talked about by everyone from Shane Dawson to Matt Pat, with Matt Pat seemingly proving the rumors false. Since they ordered a pizza from Pascali's Pizza and from the actual Chuck E. Cheese, which are made in the same kitchen, and the pizzas from Chuck E. Cheese still looked janky as hell when it's literally impossible to get recycled pizzas because of a pandemic. So it's it, it's not true, but it's certainly an interesting Easter egg nonetheless. And ultimately, in a number two, Arcade Conspiracy. The Arcade Conspiracy gets its name from one of the duffel bags that you can find, where we learn that something else seems to be going on here. Quote from this Arcade Conspiracy note, Exit interview. They are working together, the arcades. They are hiding something, the glitches. Glitch them all at the same time, then the princess will recognize me. She's testing me. I am not yet worthy. The others are protecting it. Let me stay. I'm so close. Just one more night, please. I can save the princess. Now it's clear that this seems to be referencing the Princess Quest minigames, however it doesn't really seem like we have to glitch the Princess Quest games in order to win. We just have to beat them in orders from 1 to 3 and then boom we save Vanny. So what could the rest of this mean? Well, there are three other arcade machines that seem to be having mysterious glitches as well. The Bloom Boy World game that you can find in the theater and the secret area. Chica's Feeding Frenzy which won't turn off even when unplugged that you're supposed to be able to find in the bakery but that hasn't been added added yet, and Monty Golf A Arcade that according to its duffel bag shouldn't be in the mini golf area, but it is. So what's the deal here? What's going on with these games? And does it have anything to do with the Happiest Day minigame where we need to glitch out various minigames in order to unlock the good ending of FNAF 3? I don't know, but we won't be able to know until Chica's feeding frenzy is officially added into the game because they released Security Breach. Um, without it being complete. And finally, in a number one, Freddy and Friends. In the area where you end up forcing Chica to eat garbage in order for her to get crushed, you can find a secret door. A duffel bag will be hidden next to it, indicating that you need to take a picture of the wall to continue, and doing so results in a tiny door opening, so that Freddy can't actually fit through, but you can. But the room it leads to is probably one of the most interesting things at all. A replica of the room that Mike watches the immortal and the restless in from Sister Location, even including the basket of exotic butters. If that wasn't bad enough, you can also see the Freddy and Friends cartoon on the TV, which explains why Steel Wool was posting them to begin with if they never intended on fully releasing the release date with them, since the security code on the wall was meant to be solved using these cartoons, which is why it's playing on the TV, so you associate that code with Freddy and Friends. But needless to say, it's certainly an interesting and pretty damn cool easter egg, although it opens up a whole other can of worms if that's the case, since, you know, glitch trap was found in the final episode of that and now this series exists in the FNAF world. I don't know, maybe I'll have to do more research on this really to see if there's more going on here than we realize. Number 10, Desk Man. Many believe that Desk Man is actually William Afton or Scott Cawthon. We don't know for sure, but he definitely seems to be someone who is meant to be either of those creators. Just based on all the words that he says. Desk Man at one point asks you about deactivating his games, which makes him seem like he's Scott, who makes games. However, at another time he tells you that it is too late to do anything as baby is here and she can't be deactivated, which makes him seem like he's actually William Afton. Duskman overall is definitely a mystery and secret just waiting to be solved. His death in the words he says could reflect the games or the lore depending on which role he's actually meant to resemble. Number 9. The show will begin momentarily. When you go to see Deskman, there is a direct reference to sister location that can be spotted or rather heard. You can hear the version of Circus Baby from FNAF World saying out loud, the show will begin momentarily. Everyone please stay in your seats. While the lights are out, it's here that Deskman ends up being killed. We don't know if it's Baby that causes his death or whether he does so himself. And friends, before we move on to our next spot, just a quick reminder to please, please, please click like if you love this video. Anytime that you click like, you know we get a day closer to a new FNAF game. Actually, if we get a certain amount of likes, I think we get the new FNAF game like right now. I'm just kidding, that's not gonna happen. But if you want more FNAF, you can also check out our playlist. Number eight, instant refight. Refight, is that a thing? Now it's a thing, I made it a thing, you're welcome. For Pork Patch, who is one of the bosses in the game and is terrifying by the way, there is a little secret that you might find useful while playing, which allows you to refight him immediately after you fail, if you fail. 
Hopefully you don't fail. Pork Patch just looks like some Franken pig animatronic by the way. Like an animatronic that may or may not have been made out of real pork which is now like rotting away. I'm, I'm personally, I'm just, I'm a little disturbed. For the pork patch fight there is a little shortcut you can use. Sailing on your little lily pad around and down and hitting a button in the world to refight him again. And if you didn't know about that now you know. Number 7. The honking sound. Throughout the game franchise there have been little easter eggs strewn about that allow you to create a honking sound usually by clicking on something. In the first game this would happen when clicking on the poster. In the fourth game this would happen when you clicked on the plushie on the bed. In FNAF world the nose honk sound also exists and you can find it when clicking Freddy's nose on the title screen. So if you're wondering where that honk noise went and you were hoping it was somewhere in here, you can enjoy finding it right at the beginning of the game. Honk honk! It also kind of sounds like one of those noisemakers that rolls out. What are those called? A party favor? A party blower? A party horn? You know what I mean. The things. They roll out. Number six, finding the clock ending. This is an ending that you need to be patient in order to find. It will come up during a conversation with good old glitchy Fred Bear. You gotta wait for him to get glitchy, by the way. But you can't exit out of that conversation. Don't exit out. Waiting a few moments will mean that you end up getting additional instructions, being told additionally to find the clock. The clocks are scattered throughout the game, with a few being located in the Mysterious Mine, one in Pinwheel Funhouse, another in Fazbear Hills, and one in Dusting Fields. There is a specific order in which you'll collect these clocks, starting with Fazbear Hills. Before you collect each one, you will receive additional instructions to help you know where to look, and each one can be activated by completing a puzzle or solving a game. You will then have to battle Pork Patch to receive the key, which gets you access to a warp circle, which takes you to this secret ending. So many steps. It's also believed that you need to play the game on hard mode to unlock this ending. Number 5. FNAF 4 Ending The clock ending will reveal the same character from when you first started the game. This character will reassure you that we are still your friends, but asks if you still believe that. This is similar to the ending that we see from FNAF 4, but instead of telling the player that they will put them back together again, they are instead told by the character who is obviously meant to resemble everyone's favorite psychic friend. Fredbear, but shrouded in darkness, that the pieces are in place for you, but you yourself will need to find them. This ending also gives you the Crying Child trophy, which is obviously another tie to FNAF 4. Number 4, Halloween Land. Halloween Land is an update that was added to FNAF World. However, it is an area that you can only access after beating the game. It doesn't just appear as bonus content, unlike other game updates and bonus content. One of the ways you can find and access this area is to visit Deskman after beating the game. Once you talk to him and leave his home, Fredbear will appear outside and open up a portal for you. Oh thank you, how convenient. Moving through that portal takes you to Halloween Land or the Halloween Backstage Update area, wh whichever you prefer to call it. Number 3. Secret Graveyard Path In the graveyard there is a path that takes you all the way to the beginning of the game. This shortcut can be very useful especially if you are trying to achieve certain objectives in order to unlock trophies, endings, or other such achievements in game. Once you've unlocked Halloween Land, this path will also become available to you, if you can find it. In order to do so, you'll need to position yourself between two rocks near the windmill in Fazbear Hills. From there, move left until you hit a tree. If you continue to move left without stopping, you will eventually move through that tree, sort of phasing through it, and enter Halloween Land. Ooh, spooky. Number 2. Old Man Consequences This is an ending you have to get to in a very specific way. Okay, let's go. You have to get here by visiting glitches and moving in a very specific path to the fourth one. Once you access that glitch, it will take you to a sub tunnel with nothing but some trees, a lake, and a man who is fishing on that lake. This man appears to be glitch like himself and is red with jagged teeth and seems to be kind of shaped like a crocodile? This is Old Man Consequences. He will tell you that you have bottomed out in the coat and so this is basically the end of the line for you and you must just accept it. This is one of the alternate endings you can get, however if you've gotten every other ending in the game and been here multiple times before, it's actually possible to beat and kill Old Man Consequences who 
doesn't really put up a fight. I guess he's just at peace with his lot. He's like, we're at the bottom of the code, you're killing me, whatever. Number one, final boss. Although there are a myriad of endings in FNAF World, the secret and final boss for this game, the final final boss, can only be unlocked and beaten once you have defeated all four guardians and have played through the game on hard mode. Doing so will mean you can finally head to the red tent and enter it, which will allow you to approach the final boss fight. Who is the final boss in FNAF World? Why, it's none other than Scott Cawthon, of course. Well, Scott Cawthon does seem to have similarities or connections to Deskman in the game, which we talked about earlier. This is his real in-game version. Once you instigate the fight and face off with Scott in-game, he will tell you, it was fun being the puppet master, but now I grow weary. It is time to put you in your place. This fight is a tough one, by the way, but if you manage to succeed, Scott will use his dying breath to ask you, was this really the ending you wanted? Coming all the way here just to kill me? Was I really the villain in your mind? He'll tell you that he hopes you feel good about yourself killing him and ending the story by killing the storyteller. Bursting into pixels, the words, the end will then come up on screen.